Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to Canny Commuting, the series that makes it easier for people to walk, cycle, wheel, and get public transport to work and for work. So, episode 12 is about daisy chaining journeys. It's about linking one journey onto another so that you can do lots of things in a single trip. My name is Andy, and I am your Canny Commuter in Chief, and welcome to the Canny Commuting Kitchen, from where all our episodes are broadcast. Um, Today, as I say, we're going to be talking about daisy chaining journeys. I have been living, working and commuting in the south of England for about the last 15 years. And in that time, I've been doing a whole load of mixing how I get about and putting journeys together in multiple things. But as ever, you don't need to hear loads and loads of my voice. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to introduce our two um, our two guest presenters and starting first can i introduce natalie who has Hi. is a friend of the show and has been on before but it is lovely to see you back so if you could introduce yourself to everyone that would be amazing hi i'm um, natalie um yeah similar i've been uh commuting around the south of england with uh bikes and trains um for around the same amount of time as well, about 15 years. Excellent. And then assuming that I am able to work the technology, I would like to introduce Amy. Now, Amy is brand new to the show and it's probably worth saying that we've only really spoken to each other over social media up until now. So it's absolutely fabulous to see you in person and face to face. Could you introduce yourself to the crowd for me, please? Hello, um, I'm Amy and I've been um, well, I guess I've only been full time working for the past five years, mostly commuting by train. But for the past um, four months, I've been cycling um, all over the Barham area as well. Excellent. Thank you. So, without further ado, um, Natalie, could you talk me through some of the journeys that you daisy chain together so we get an idea of exactly what it is we're talking about? Uh, yeah, so it's uh, mainly local journeys, so uh, the food shop, going to town, dentist, doctors, post office, library, school, uh, friends and family, and um, work, not necessarily in that order. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And, and Amy, uh, what journeys are you doing that you're daisy chaining together? Um, I guess some of it similar to Natalie, yeah. um, so like food and sometimes on work days I might like pop into town or something if it makes sense to you um, and then a lot of my journeys are also linked to bird watching so locally and also when I go on holidays further afield if a rare bird is vaguely en route I might detour if the trains all like link up We'll get you back in to come and talk about getting to hard to reach places later in the summer where we'll talk about that in inordinate detail. Um, so I so I I have I mix work, shopping, dentist, doctors, hairdresser. Hairdresser is one that I often we were talking about this earlier. I have hair that grows incredibly fast, so I have to get mine cut fairly often. But it's 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 kind of those little journeys where going out and coming back seems like a, a massive faff, and it's how how we go about fitting those together. So Amy, how do you decide which of those journeys you're going to tether together into a single journey? Um, sometimes it's kind of spur of the moment. Like I quite often cycle down to Hill Hen and Titchfield Haven um, for bird watching. And then it kind of makes sense to go home via Stubbington. So I'll then text the family and say, oh, do you want me to? stop off and buy food but um other times I guess you think about what things you need to do or where you need to go and whether um it would make sense to combine any of them like places that are close together um or kind of if I guess you have to think about like the weight limits for the bike if you're cycling and 
whether it would work to link up, say, shopping and um, visiting a friend or whichever journeys might work. <laughs> Natalie, how about you? What, what goes into your thought process about deciding how you're going to daisy chain those journeys together? Um, I was thinking about this and um, it's kind of, I now jump on the bike as readily as I would once have jumped into the car um, because it's become such a habit. So I don't really think about it anymore. Um, but uh, when I was still thinking about it early days, then um, I'd have been thinking about how far, where I'm going, what the route would be like, um, what combination of panniers or anything I would need to take out how, how much stuff I would need to take with me um I'm lucky in that I've got a cargo bike nowadays so actually most things that would have fitted in the car in fact more sometimes sometimes more things fit into the cargo bike that are awkward shaped than would fit into a car so um I, I really don't have to think about it at all now but um yeah it tends to be local journeys um if, if I've got to take a train that I wouldn't norm like a journey that I wouldn't normally do by train then I have to think a bit more about it yeah <laughs> excellent yeah I mean I'm, I'm very much the same as Natalie the reason why I've got you two in here is that I don't really think about this anymore so the stuff that for me happens on autopilot is is the stuff that's really important I, I suppose when I'm choosing what to daisy chain together it's it's around how routes conveniently link up or if you know if I find myself in a particular part of Southampton and there's a thing I've been meaning to do that's nearby then that will trigger those thought processes um or if I get a message that says we've run out of milk could you get some then that often triggers that but that kind of leads leads quite neatly into the the kind of next question I was going to ask which is what preparation do you make before you set off to enable you to daisy chain those journeys together Natalie um, so think about where I'm going, which way I'm going, um, because I mean, most of the time it's aut autopilot. And I, I, tend to, I think there are grooves in, in the paths that I've, I've used over the years where I <laughs> used to use them. Um, but but anywhere different, I will have to think about where I'm going and which way to go, because you don't, especially if I've got children with me. Um, I don't want to take them along certain routes. Um, I prefer to go on quieter roads and, and cycle paths. Um, I think about what I've got to carry. So um, whether I need panniers, whether I need a, a, a bag on, on the rack, um, whether I need to take the children's helmets with me if I'm going to pick them up and they've got their bikes uh, or if I'm picking them up with a cargo bike. I can I sometimes forget the helmets, which is not good because then I have to go back um, and start again. Um, and I sometimes use my phone as a sat nav as well. So I'll take that with me for routes that I'm not 100% sure of and can click that onto the handlebar um, if I, you know, yeah, if I'm unsure, uncertain. Excellent. Amy, how about you? What what preparation do you make when you're going to be doing these multiple journeys together? Um, I partly think about, again, like what stuff I might need, because if I'm um, going bird watching with all my gear, that takes up quite a lot of the rack. So there isn't then as much space or currently the weight limit left to, say, go shopping as well. And when I like get to the shops, I then have to lug all the gear as well, which isn't as ideal. So I guess you, um, I try and think, would it actually work to link up with the bird watching, or should I save it for a different trip when I can just do lots of um, kind of running errands and where then I've got plenty of space and think about which panniers to take. I've got one um, made by Arkle which is like a haulet one and it you can fit a normal rucksack in it or any kind of bag so that's really handy for a lot of journeys. Excellent yeah I mean this is the point where we get told off for advertising them again but um 
I am a massive fan of the Ortley panniers. These will swallow so much stuff. And the joy of knowing it's waterproof is, is really important. One of the things I discovered when I first started using a bike to go places and kind of mixing motor, motor journeys is I can carry an inordinate amount of weight on the back of the bike. It's far more than I can actually carry around the shop. So I need to be quite careful about about weight and stuff but actually the thing that always catches me out is these will swallow loads of stuff but shopping is enormous and, and and the number of times when i've kind of gone i need that and i need that and i need and then sort of try to and it's often space that's the real thing so so my kind of stuff that goes with me like like a waterproof and tools has to be really small to make space for the other stuff i'm going to put in there um but yeah those those are kinds of things we we're kind of talking a lot about bikes at the moment um when it comes to parking so we talk about how, you know, riding your bike is great because you don't have to really, you know, you, you, parking's dead easy. But we all know it's not quite as straightforward as that. What do you look for when you're stopping and leaving the bike somewhere to do a job? Um, we'll go for Amy first. Um, I guess so far I've been looking for like the Sheffield stands. They're quite good for um, attaching like knocking up different kinds of bikes, although I found it quite tricky. I've got a turn folding bike and it's quite long. So that's been tricky with working out the locks and how to do it. But other than that, those stands seem quite good. Um, or like a nice undercover shelter would be even better, but I've not found any yet. <laughs> Natalie, how about you? What 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 do you look for when you're when you're parking the bike up somewhere? Same, a nice Sheffield stand with a cover is always lovely, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I've had to cycle or walk around grumpily muttering to myself about car dominance and how cars are treated better than, than people. But um, then I tend to find something if I can't find a Sheffield stand, I um, find something solid or secure to the ground, both preferably out of the way, but in plain sight. <laughs> Um, that I can lock the bike to and I haven't I have been in two places and said I'm really sorry especially if I've got an appointment time to make and I've looked and I can't find anywhere I have gone in and said I'm really sorry I can't find anywhere to lock my bike um, and usually people come up with something um, I've even taken it into things with me <laughs> they've been very accommodating but um yeah, I think it's important that people know when you've tried and they can't find somewhere they, they need to maybe help you. Um, but but yeah, usually there's something that might be a railing or a fence that's out of the way of people. But um, I like a good Sheffield stand. Yeah. Yeah. So, so most of the time for, for me, a, a D-lock is absolutely fine. Um, if I'm going somewhere where I haven't had a chance to prepare, so if I'm going somewhere for a meeting or for work or something like that, I will, I will usually, as part of the chat with the person organising the meeting, say, so where do I lock my bike up? Um, which sometimes can be quite entertaining. Um, but if I don't know, oh, oh, and those of you who are frequent watchers of the scene will know that I, I am a big fan of spending more of my life than is healthy on street view, looking for things like Sheffield stands. And that, if you've got the time, that can be quite helpful. But I say, if I'm going somewhere where I don't know where I'm going, I don't want it. Taking a cable with the D-lock can make it loads more flexible and things that you wouldn't necessarily be able to lock, that I wouldn't necessarily be able to lock this to, with a cable and a D-lock together, covers most things that are an immovable piece of infrastructure. Speaking of that, um, Amy, are there any lessons that you've learned from trial and error and from experience this is the point where you where you admit to all the mistakes that you made when when you first started doing this so that other people don't have to make the same ones um i think when i've done some of the bird watching like holidays with daisy chaining i think one of my mistakes was not thinking as well as I should have about actually how far away from my target destination the rare bird might have been. So I um, was planning to visit Mole and Iona and I saw there was a bird at Nairn and I thought, oh, that's nice and easy. I can 
get the sleeper train to Inverness and it did work out just about but I forgot that um, Inverness is actually a long way away from Oban so it took a long time um, but I think with the cycling I'm still kind of trying out lots of different things and still learning um, like I found the same with the panniers that actually they don't fit as much food as I thought so having to I think I'm planning to upgrade to like a small cargo bike so that should help with having a bit more flexibility in space um yeah excellent Natalie any 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 um nuggets of wisdom to allow people to learn for learn the lessons for your mistakes um <laughs> uh forgetting children's helmets is a, a big one for me as you picked up last time I said that um so now I every time I pick up my helmet I think how many of these do I need to take with me um then uh taking buying too much stuff classic for me as well so what I tend to do is I take the so if I'm in, in the supermarket I'll clip the panniers onto the side of the supermarket and fill them directly when you do the quick scan um and then I know exactly how much space I've got um and there's always bungee cords for a little bit extra um <laughs> that's probably two of my bit oh and forgetting a lock forgetting a lot because a lot of my journeys won't need like if I'm daisy chaining I've literally got the bike with me I'm going to pick up something from my parents or the pick up children from the school or something I don't really need to leave it anywhere particularly um unsafe but then I might go to the supermarket and and I haven't got my lock with me so um it's just remembering I think um but I, I've got it relatively slick now. <laughs> now now we did talk earlier when we were having the pre-meet about a, a very important lesson you learned about how to get on and off your bike with children on oh yes yeah <laughs> yes so it's very easy if you're daisy chaining journeys to um because you you have children potentially for part of the journey and then not for another part of the journey and so getting on and off my bike something i would have liked to have is a, a drop top tube um so i actually have to kind of step over the bike uh, but of course if they my children are, are too old to go on the back of the bike now but um when my daughter was on the back of the bike once i i forgot she was there and got off as normal and just whacked her around the head with my foot uh, with my leg so that that's not ideal um yeah just remembering remembering they're there <laughs> is a good one um and if you have a, a choice or a chance to have a, a drop top tube if you are going to um carry children on the back of your bike then it's it's ideal especially panniers if you've got panniers then they're quite a, it's quite a big area to step over you can lean the bike down and sort of step over um in a, in a more sort of delicate way um but if the panniers are heavy then leaning the bike can be challenging so and if you've got a child on the back leaning the bike can be very challenging not not recommended so um yeah a drop tube a dropped top tube would have been would be nice but i survived there. excellent <laughs> yes uh, time for this. I, I was going to say that the number of times i've accidentally booted a french stick sticking out of my pannier is just it's <laughs> you wouldn't believe the, th the thing that I've, i was just literally just thinking about this right now the thing that i've probably learned from it from mistakes and experiences about shoes and it's about where the right shoes for where i'm going rather than necessarily the right shoes or the best shoes for being on the bike because as i'm sure amy will, will, will be able to tell you going it walking any distance in shoes that are really good for riding in is just not the most pleasant and i have in the olden days when I used to wear shiny cycling shoes to ride to work, did have to spend the entire day in my shiny um, gloss white shoes in important meetings with directors, which was deeply embarrassing. So I now, I now think about what shoes I need to need to have when I get somewhere and adjust everything back from that. Right. I think I've grilled you for long enough. Amber, do we have any questions from the chat? 
we do indeed. So I was actually going to start with one for Amy, if that's all right. I know you spoke about um, getting your bike on the train. Was there any tips you had for getting your bike on the train at all? Um, I guess it can be quite tricky, but um, you can check online where, so that you know that in theory there should be um, space on the train and you can like book a slot that sometimes you find like people have just got on without doing that so um it's actually someone you then have to find just a nice gap to leave the bike and hope the train cards kind of let you so it can get quite busy um on like the commuter train i use you often get people parking them in the doorways because it ends up getting so full but so it's not ideal but do you lock your bike on the train or do you feel quite safe to leave it and sit down in a seat or do you stay with the bike or um i guess if it's in one of the like designated areas um i would want to lock it just in case but um otherwise stay with it if like it's just kind of in a random gap somewhere sure. Um, and I know you take it on the train, but can you take a bike on the bus? I know you have a folding bike, so maybe that's different. Um, I've never tried, but I believe that you might be allowed a folding bike, but I think it varies. You have to sort of ask them and see what they say. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think my understanding is for a lot of bus companies, a folding bike is okay. Sometimes they ask for something weird, like, can you do a folding bike in a bag? which is slightly odd, but by and large, unless it says you can take bikes on this bus, which is mostly in Scotland, because as we know, everything is better for sustain. So um, unless you, there are there are only very specific routes that you can take a full size non folding bike on the bus. By and large, if you get in the bus, it's going to be a case of finding somewhere secure to leave the bike, get on the bus and then picking it up when you get back is, is my understanding. Um, excellent. Any other questions that we've got? Yes, um, so there was one about using a trailer and whether that would um, make shopping bigger loads easier. Has anyone had any experience using a trailer? Um, I had a trailer for carrying two children at one point. Um, I I could put a lot of shopping in that, even with the, <laughs> even with the children in it. It's packed in around, <laughs> around the shopping. Um, I would say it, a different experience because you're a whole lot longer and you've, you've got um, a hinged point on the back of your bike and um, so uh, certain um, uh, like pinch points where you have to normally you'd go through easily with a, a, a two-wheel bike suddenly you appreciate how hard it is for people who don't have that because um, the trailer is not as um easy to get through i've now got a cargo bike which is i think easier than having a trailer um because it's all fixed um in one one sort of line like just riding a bike <laughs> brilliant thank you um and then another one is how do people build their cycling distance and feel more confident chaining more journeys together is there a way that so obviously you probably start with one journey to work and then you think, oh, I could go to work and the dentist. Is there a way you got more confident in that? Um, I think oh, um, for me, when I originally um, started cycling again, one of my main targets to begin with was um, for the bird watching um, down at Hill Head. So that was a nice way to start it off and it had hills in it as well which were very hard work at first but I could then see that I was gradually getting more and more used to it so then I did just start thinking well if I can manage this distance what about this because it's like slightly further but still kind of hopefully within range and then yeah I think you do just gradually um see that your muscles are getting used to it and you can go further and further 
Um, I don't know about you, Amy, but um, when I wasn't cycling as much or walking as much over lockdown, um, I, I really noticed the difference because I wasn't particularly doing massive miles on my bike, but I was doing lots of little short journeys, which don't, you don't really notice. Um, and I put on loads of weight <laughs> that time because I wasn't doing those tiny little short journeys from here to there. And um, when a friend of mine said, would you like to come on a bike ride? And I thought, well, I, haven't, I don't I don't do that sort of distance. I was really worried about it. And then I realised that actually I do do that distance. I just do it in lots of short little journeys. And then if you add them all up, it does actually equate to quite a lot. Um, so I, I'd say to, to build up and just, you know, just do those short little journeys and don't worry about stopping because stopping is fine. You can do it very easily on a bike. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would say for me, the 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 issue for me is not because I'm relatively fit. It's how many different things I'm doing, and I think my advice would be, don't do more than one new thing on any given journey because otherwise you're you're kind of building stress into that, and you know, don't don't kind of do a change on the train that you've never done before and go to somewhere that you've never been before on the same trip. So do one new thing each time so you can embed that because once you've done something once it's less stressful the next time and that's that that would be very much my tip is is build the number of things you're doing gradually in the same way as you would build distance more gradually so we've got a couple more so um maybe maybe a slightly trickier one but um i was wondering how challenging it is to convince people of the feasibility of daisy chaining as opposed to jumping in the car um are there any infrastructure asks that could help with this e.g additional parking or more site uh, segregated lanes. But Tony, you're you're you're. Uh, um, I, I, I can feel this unless Natalie um, has <laughs> has a burning desire to, but crack on. I, I don't I don't know who's asking this, but um, if there were segregated lanes, if there were dedicated cycle lanes everywhere, and if there were lovely facilities everywhere, then I know so many of my friends would use them would cycle who don't who who currently drive um so you know the <laughs> the um the thing of oh well we don't have many cyclists here so therefore we don't need facilities thing that that doesn't wash with me um if you if you build it they will come when it comes to cycling um and walking um so yes definitely if it's if you can get there safely and um, people will there's a latent desire um, among people to be able to travel in a, in a nice way <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely i mean absolutely agree with everything that they said i think the honest answer is telling someone that something is feasible is never going to change their behavior um until some until i see someone like me doing journeys like i want to do by bike and by train and on foot i'm not going to think it's realistic but it might be worth saying if you've got someone that you're trying to convince that this is this is doable, say, why don't we do it together? Say, I'll tell you what, why don't I ride home from work via the shops to your house and then I'll go home or I'll get the train to buy your house and we, I can drop you at the shop and you can get home from there. Because having someone with you to say, yes, this is doable, regardless of what it is, can make a massive difference to how, how much you believe yourself that, that this is doable. Great, thank you. Just the final one. Um, do you think logging your journeys is good? And what would you advise me to use to log these? Do you log like your it. journeys, Amy? Um, I have been just on my phone, um, which sort of works for the journeys where I know the distance. Um, I've just been logging how far it is. It's I think it'd be interesting to a bit like how a car records like your total mileage. I think it would be quite nice to see all the miles rack up and then you're also able to show yourself and other people that you've done, achieved all of that. Um, but I think depending what you want to record, there are um, cycling computers of I think varying costs that they can also record your like speeds and stuff, which you might find interesting. Um, but I don't have any of them yet. I've just been using the like health app on my phone because it will take your 
total distance, which is quite useful. If I'm setting out for um, a longer journey, then I will use Strava um, to record it. Um, but for all the tiny little journeys here and there and everywhere, I don't record it, except that on on a bike, one of the bikes that I've got, my cargo bike, um, it's got an odometer on it. And so I can see that I do as many miles on that as I was previously doing on my car before I sold it, which is quite a nice thing to see. Um, but they're all such short little journeys. I never feel it's worth <laughs> worth actually logging. So the overall amount is quite interesting to look at. So I log mine. I have a, a Garmin watch, so I log everything on that because it's easy. Um, and, it, and and as Amy says, it's it's actually quite nice to kind of get to the end of a month or at the end of the year and go, wow, I travelled really far. Mm -hmm. My watch throws everything across onto Strava, and it's only recently that I've twigged something else which is the kind of social element of seeing what other people do. So if you've got friends on something like Strava or Commute or one of these other platforms, you can see the journeys they're making. And, and, and I do know for a fact there was someone I saw recently did a ride from where I am in Winchester to Eastleigh, and they said, I've got rid of the car. I was like, do you know what? I could I could really do that. And that kind of inspiration, but also seeing where other people go can be quite good as a, as a, as a motivation. But um, And it forces me not to be lazy and just get the train everywhere. But yeah. Excellent. Is that all the questions, Amber? Yes, it is. Thank you. So, so I'm, I'm going to ask both our contributors. Um, if people only remember one thing from today, what would you like them to remember? I'm going to let Natalie go first and then I'll come to Amy. Um, I would say to give it a go and to remember that it doesn't always feel easy the very first time but it very quickly becomes something that fits in with you um by cycling or walking more you're giving yourself more options sometimes it might be that you take your car if you've got one um but you're giving yourself more options and when I cycle or walk past stationary traffic and I, I think I'm glad I didn't take the car today um, it, it's so worth it. It means you can get to places on time and you feel better about it. And so just give it a go and see how you do and take it easy on yourself. Amy. I think kind of the same as Natalie, um, but also um, by like trying to do more of your journeys by bike or walking or like even public transport, if that's the only alternative um as well as getting them all done and like giving it a go you're kind of building an exercise without even thinking about it so it's like a nice bonus brilliant i think probably my my one takeaway would be a bit like natalie's things don't always work the first time and it feel things feel difficult the first time but give it a go and give it a go a second time because it's actually it always feels a lot better the second time you try something. Okay, that is just about all we've got time for today. I am going to say thank you very, very much to Natalie. Thank you for coming on today. And thank you very much to Amy. I'm going to unpin you whilst I do the closing bit. So <clears throat> So thank you all very much for coming. Canny Commuting is a My Journey Hampshire production in association with Sustrans and is funded by National Highways. I'm really grateful for you all being here. We also have um, all of our episodes are, go, are up on YouTube. So if you want to see any of the previous 11 episodes, they're on our YouTube channel. Next week, we are back when we are talking about electric bikes and how to make the most of those. Thank you all very much for coming. Have a lovely week and enjoy the sunshine. Goodbye.